Good evening, Cross Culture family, friends. How are you all doing? Hey, uh, Sunday night, 7 o'clock. Let's get rolling. Tonight, uh, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And I want to remind you that in each and every season, you have the opportunity to be grateful for the things that God has done. And here's the interesting thing about being grateful for the things that God has done. There are things that he's done that you haven't even noticed. So we are always able to give him glory. I was just reading tonight and it seems like the, the momentum as it relates to religious liberties and the Supreme Court is picking up steam. Um, New Jersey has been called to respond uh, as it relates to a religious liberties case. So I, I, would, I would suspect that uh, shortly there will be some other cases coming to the forefront. Obviously, uh, our case has, has been there. We've been there, but as these cases begin to pile up as it relates to the Supreme Court acknowledging uh, what constitutionally has been <clears throat> understood for quite a long time about religious liberty, I, I think that uh, every case that presents itself will find uh, success. And that, that is what we want, not for the sake of rubbing it in anybody's faces, but truly this, in America, we've been given such a great opportunity in the sense that the church is protected. You don't see that in every country. And so why it is that we would wait at any point to defend this right and to make certain that this this remains a hallmark in our society, um, I don't think we can excuse waiting. I don't think we could excuse sideline, sidelining at any point. So whether it be the first or the second shutdown, in each of those, understand that... Um, that there's something to be corrected about the way that they were handled. They need to be handled correctly. And it's not to say that lives um, should not be protected. Of course, we're Christians and our mindset is always that of life. But um, in America, we've been given this inter interesting opportunity and that is truly life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, I think these are fundamental as it relates to the health and and the vibrancy and the longevity of our country. And to deny any portion of that would be a great danger to all. Not just to the church, to all. All right? So grab your Bibles. Let's get into the Word tonight. Three points we're going to cover. All right? One, point one, through Christ we gain the best way to be human. Interesting, huh? It's the best way to be human, which is to serve our Creator. The best way to be human is to serve our Creator. We live within a temporal life with an eternal view. I mean, that, that is an amazing thing if you think about it. And, and somewhat confusing at points about our priorities as things begin to stack up. But that's where a free heart and a free mind continue to look down the road, understanding that it is both straight and narrow, which means it's not confusing. It has one direction of travel. And it means our focus has to be fixed and sure. All right, straight and narrow. Point two tonight, his promise defines us. So in the beginning, God created man and his intention for man was good and his creation, as he, as he called it, it was very good. But here's an interesting point. Because he gave us free will, we were able to choose and we chose poorly. Not because God designed us to choose poorly, because our focus became upon those, you know, began to be fixed upon those things that were uh, intending to destroy us. And here's the, here's the fun part of, of what we begin to unravel as it relates to our nature, is that God is truly attempting to rescue us from our own choices. And love relationships don't exist outside of choice. They don't. There's no true relationship at all, in fact, if one is a captive. That's why Paul talks about being a slave to Christ, because he chose it. He chose to be a slave to Christ because he understood that in Christ, although he be a slave to Christ, in Christ was freedom. Point three tonight, last one. God calls all to reconciliation. I, I, I mentioned a little bit of how things are gonna go as far as, you know, Stuff has to play out here locally and and even as a state and maybe maybe higher county and state level as it relates to to the way that we're proceeding forward with the case 
and with issues that we've had locally. Clearly, uh, there's been things denied to us that were contractually promised, and we'll get all that figured out. But the ultimate goal is to see people awaken to the reality of their heart and understanding of how things could truly be better. And what created the pattern of failure? How was it that we began to buy in, whether it be competition, whether it be jealousy, anger, whatever it was, whatever purpose we had in us at that point in time, if we depart from the plan of Christ, it doesn't matter what we're involved in, whether whether it be business, whether it be church, whether it be family, you name it. When we depart from the will of Christ, destruction's the only option left. And there were points that Christ dealt with people, dealt with people that he truly loved. And they chose to walk away. They chose to rebel instead of choosing reconciliation. And so their options became limited. They could either come and repent and make things right. Or they could continue on their path. And maybe through the destruction of their flesh, their soul might be saved. And that's a reference to Paul's writing in Corinthians as it relates to dealing with people that are involved in sexual immorality. But we'll see this as a common theme that where, where purity is denied, where it's refused, where we, where we choose to remain compromised and tainted, you'll find destructive, destructive behavior, you'll find cyclical behavior that, that leads to nothing, drunkenness, jealousy, rage, anger, you name it. it. It's all there. And that's why James talks about it so clearly that once this behavior is seen in us, we, we shouldn't deny it. We should acknowledge it and choose to do better. That's why accountability is so important. So we have our Bibles. Praise God. I mentioned this this morning. Not every country is allowed to have them. And I know that some would argue, of course they are. No, they're not. No, they're not. All right? So verse 1 of chapter 3, Colossians. Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Looking back to point one tonight. Through Christ, we gain the best way to be human. That is to be Christ-like. We must remain focused and grateful for the gift of salvation, which means our view is not just on our daily circumstances as it relates to taking care of our responsibility, but there's this constant introduction, reintroduction, and perspective of Christ that needs to be had in each and every situation. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, Paul talks about praying without ceasing. And this means that we're moving towards a constant meditation of our lives being in Christ. And so thus, every decision we make is rooted in that existence, is that I am no longer mine, but I am Christ. Therefore, every decision that I have, every mood, every feeling, every thought, every desire, every hope and every dream is, is put into his hands and I cast aside my wants. I, I get rid of them so that... I fulfill what God has called me to do in knowing that he sets the table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm confident that my needs will be met. So whether the season's going all your way or whether it's not, and this is the part of perseverance. This is the part of perseverance. This is the lesson in this season as it relates to standing against the tide, which I believe not just me, but we as a church have, has, have done. And you guys have been great. You've been prayerful. You've been checking in. I know it's frustrating to not see each other in person right now. And, and we would be if it wasn't that we were locked out of our building. But I, I think that's coming to a conclusion as well. All right. And I'm going to keep praying towards that. And hopefully there's com some conversations that will be had soon. So we'll allow God to work even in the midst of this circumstance, in the midst of this time and this season. All right. And then when we're together, just think about how great it's going to be. I'm looking forward to it, seriously. Christ accomplished everything we needed by his death. He left nothing out. Absolutely nothing was left out. And this is where doubt wants to creep in at points because, see, our interpretation of victory would be destroying and killing all our enemies. No, victory, as it relates to a life in Christ, is serving, life, is serving Christ successfully no matter what our enemies do. 
no matter what they do, no matter who calls what victory or, or says that they got one up, as long as we are doing what Christ has called us to do, it doesn't matter what our enemies do. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we are living a holy and righteous life and that we're keeping track of our heart, our attitude, our response, and we don't become bitter and we don't become entrenched or hostile to the voice of the Spirit because we're mad. See, as Creator, He came and redeemed us through the New Covenant. And here's what people often confuse about the New and the Old Covenant. The New Covenant didn't displace the Old Covenant. The New Covenant fulfilled all that the Old Covenant had required. In this, that Christ came, He was perfect. He lived a life without sin, but He died a sinner's death. And He did it intentionally for the sake of all who would need to be rescued from their sin. This is why Paul talks about that we're saved by faith, not by works. Well, what's our faith in? Well, our faith's in the reality of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross for us. If we truly thought that works could save us, it it would be, as John writes in 1 John, that we would come to God saying, through my works I've achieved a status of having no sin, so you need to receive me in such a fashion. And John's saying, this isn't available to you. This, what's available to you is repentance. Not equality, it's repentance. And, and so when people deny that they have sin because they think, well, I did this bad, so I'll go out and do this good and everything's great. That's not how it works. That's, that's just confusion. That is creating actually a situation that's worse because every intention that you had in doing what was quote-unquote a good work was not for the glory of God. It was a cover-up. That's going to make a mess. Grab your Bibles again. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4. As you're turning there, the provision of such a covering that Christ gave us should bring us to the place of continual praise. There's always an opportunity to praise. There's always a reason to praise. It is through thanksgiving we walk into a state of healing from the effects of sin and out of the effects of sin, excuse me, and become reconciled to the will of God and his will for us is good. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4 says this, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? So great a salvation. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, I do teach an entire series on the gifts of the Spirit, even on speaking in tongues, which I know will freak some people out, but I'm not a cessationist. So I do believe in the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I do believe in signs and wonders. I do believe in speaking in tongues. Some people will say, well, I've been to churches where it was where it was misused. Yeah, like, 1 Corinthians. And Paul didn't shut it down. It it baffles me that people get out of that book that Paul was calling for an end of tongues. He was clarifying its intent. I'm baffled. Baffled. But we'll move on because that's not what we're discussing tonight. Anyhow, point two. His promise defines us. His promise defines us. Back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality. Read that again. Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality. Dead to impurity. Dead to passion. Dead to evil desire. Dead to greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. 
So this is an interesting clarification that we need to focus on. Paul says what divides you from them is your current behavior. At one point you were living just like them, but now you're not. And I need you to continue to consider yourselves as dead to the following things. Because if you do not, if they awaken in you, how quickly can you be taken to the things that you were rescued from? Quite, quite quickly, actually. And as God begins to develop in us an understanding of what he's calling us to and what he's calling us out of, we'll see that those, those former sins, those hindrances are going to want to establish themselves permanently or show up from, from time to time to throw us off course. That's why there needs to be a little bit of righteous indignation in us when they come up and we're, we respond to them, well, accordingly. Which is to say, no, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not going to happen. And if you need accountability outside just the discussion between you and God, then you go find it. It is not worth sinning to keep things a secret. It's not. It's just not. It will set you back quite a bit. Keep reading. Come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Verse 8, But now you also rid yourselves of all of them, and he adds to the list, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices. So what is lying rooted in then? If he says immorality is rooted in these things and lying is rooted in these things, when a person is dishonest, it's not rooted in righteousness. It's because they're involved in dishonorable things that they think the practice is normal. I've had people explain their lying by saying, well, you know why so-and-so lied? Because if, the fa if they told you the truth, well, what? Well, if they told you the truth, then correction would have come. So the whole thing was about rebellion. See, anytime we begin to excuse lying for the sake of covering up for what we wanted to do, and we know that if we told the truth, we would be stopped. That is the definition of rebellion. That is what it is. And so when people begin to obscure the truth, what is it rooted in? Well, it's rooted in anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech. So at the bottom of the barrel is nothing good. There's nothing good at the bottom of the barrel at all. It is not worth going any deeper in that situation. But Paul says this, And having put on a new self, which being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is, is all and in all. So his promise defines us. Heaven we need to remember, heaven is uncompromised, it is pure, and it is faultless, and is asking for people that have focused on such. See, when we begin to emulate and live the nature of the Father, when we begin to, uh, when we begin to invite Him to speak into us, He is going to lead us away from things that that would have destroyed us. In fact, there's points people miss miss that they've invested a lot in destruction and God comes in and rescues them from the entire situation. Now, there are other times that people have to go through things because it's part of the process. But I've seen people rescued from a great amount of wrong and it doesn't mean that God has to show up and do that for everyone. It means in that circumstance, he's chosen to. And if we're angry with God because he doesn't rescue us from everything that we've sown into, we don't really love him. We're telling him, it doesn't matter what you think, I don't want to go through this. It doesn't matter that you know everything, I don't want to go through this. And if you make this, me go through this, I'm going to be really mad at you. Instead, what is God working things out for? He's working them out for our good. Everybody learns different. <clears throat> and that's not an excuse to sin, but explains why we face sometimes such a great amount of opposition. 
It is through pure, the, the purity of Christ that he was able to fulfill the law for the sake of man. It, it is purity that aligns us and strengthens us and secures us. Jesus, in his presentation of God to the earth, was, was everything that he knew of the Father displayed for us. There's nothing about God that is now a mystery because of the revelation of Christ. Jesus said that he and the Father were one. So therefore, the only one we are called to pattern ourselves after is Christ. See, if Christ and the Father are one, then to live as Christ is to please the Father, which means that we are sanctified and we become sacrificial. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 4, 1 through 4. Paul writes this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And this is why Matthew 18 is so important. If you offer somebody an opportunity to meet and that opportunity does not yield a proper you know, conclusion, then you invite elders in. Then you invite a larger crowd into the situation. First, it's you and them, then you and someone else and them, and then it, it just gets bigger and bigger. And this is, this is necessary because it begins to test the heart of people involved. I myself offered people these situations and had them rejected because really at the end of the, end of the day, the discussion was not about what was right. It was about what they wanted. And so when scripture displeases you, when, when we come to a scriptural response to a situation and that displeases the other party, listen, there's nothing that you can do other than pray for them and put it in God's hands and be patient and wait and do what is right. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Therefore, or there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Point three tonight, God calls all to reconciliation. Stay in chapter four of Ephesians. I'll read you the last verse from Colossians chapter one. It's just the, or chapter three, excuse me. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Last point, God calls us to reconciliation. The anger of God is reserved for those who ignore the testimony of his spirit. Disobedience ends all good options. It ends all good options and it only invites destruction, all right? Disobedience ends all good options and only invites destruction. See, confusion is the result of division and you can have division within yourself. Remember what Paul talks about is that the, the flesh and the spirit are at war and so confusion really exists within the fact that we don't want to suffer anything for, for a God we claim to love. For a God, we're willing to give everything. We, we don't want to go through it. Lord, I'd love for you to make this whole thing more like flag football. I really don't want to take any hits. I, you know, it, it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant. But the Lord tells us very clearly that he will be with us through trial and tribulation. That suffering actually is a regular part of life. Things always don't go, you know, things don't always go our way. They're not always easy. But there are times when great victories are had. And you see it even within the Old Testament. Great victories are had. And then the seasons that follow are the seasons that follow. And there are, there are things that you have to reconcile in your heart to the reality of living a temporal life. Which means you don't always end up staying on top of the mountain as it relates to everyone around you. 
You have to accept that there are good seasons, there are bad seasons, there are highs, there are lows. There are victories, and there are things at points that look like defeat. But God is faithful in the midst of all of it. He knows the times and seasons. He set things in order. And if we remain on the path, the straight and narrow, with our eyes fixed on him, good things will come out of what appears to the world to be just wrecked and wrong completely. But the saint who knows his father or her father, the saint who knows him, rests in him. God calls us to live to live blessed lives. He calls us to live with discernment. And discernment is rooted in wisdom. It's rooted in an understanding of who God is and who he's calling us to be. And this is the last verse tonight, Ephesians 14 through 16 in chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful schemes. That's important. When people are deceitful, they really think they're smart, but God puts people in deceitful people's ways sometimes that just don't buy their stuff. It's the best thing for them. It stinks to get caught. It stinks to have your covers pulled, but it's the best thing for you. Really, so that God, God can allow you to be seen by those who truly desire to help you and truly want to see you benefit. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the nature or the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. How do we grow? We learn to love. Well, I'm a loving person, Pastor John. Well, usually we're really good at loving ourselves and we invite other people in because they're lucky to be loved by us. Sacrificial love is not always a party. It's difficult. It takes long suffering. It takes a willingness to get into the trenches and to even dig them at points for long battles for the sake of the heart and mind of, of family members, of a church that's gone astray, of a town, city, state, you name it. And I'm praying right now. I, I believe this. I believe some significant things are going to happen here in California. I just do. I think we're going to find out that things are much different than we thought and we agree on more than we didn't. And there's maybe even a lot of people moved because, well, the truth wasn't told. The state wasn't actually the way everybody wanted us to believe it was. I'm praying that leads to revival and healthy families and homes that can reconcile. Fathers back in the homes, children with a vision of the future because they feel loved and secure and protected. That's what I believe is coming. I do. I do. And we're going to fight for it. All right? We're going to fight for it. We're going to get involved. I'm going to say it even on here. We're going to get involved politically. Why? Because if the church doesn't learn to steer politics in a righteous manner, it will ultimately be turned by to politics in the wrong way. And it's okay to be a Christian and involved in politics. And if you're a Christian and you don't vote, shame on you. And if you're a Christian and you don't take a stand against abortion, shame on you. If you're a pastor and you don't preach against abortion, shame on you. If we cannot protect the life at the beginning and the end, sooner or later, the middle won't matter anymore anyway. Do you know that this, I saw this report the other day, or actually today, that, that Japan had more suicides than COVID deaths. Horrible. If you love people as you are called to love people, this is a tragedy that should grieve you. But I do believe that hope will prevail. That trust in God will prevail. I do. I do. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of this season. And I'm happy you're part of this season. And I know you've been praying for me and I've been praying for you. Take heart. Look up. Because the your Savior draweth nigh, just telling you.
God is on the throne and he is shaking some things up. I'll talk to you soon. Hope to see you soon. And uh, until then, let's be one. Love you.